My guest today is Darcy Lucier. Darcy, how are you? Good. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's been a long time since I've seen you in person. And it has now, been. And now we're teammates. I know. I know. Now we're both at the mothership. It's great. <laughs> That's awesome. So you joined Microsoft when? Uh, it will be actually three years this month. Oh, congratulations. Awesome. Yeah. And then yeah, what's you. the big news is that you uh, our two teams merged. That uh, GPS right. Canada, GPS US are now GPS Americas and GPS Latin America as well. That's right. Yeah, one big, one big happy family here at Microsoft <laughs> on the GPS side. So that's awesome. And I understand yeah. you're you're working a lot with uh, artificial intelligence. Is that is that rumor true? That you know, I think everybody is right now. I think I think AI is top of mind for uh, for so many people, and especially in my role. Um, so, like for those listening, you know. It, David and I are both in the Global Partner Solutions Group. So we work with our partner ecosystem um, within Microsoft. And so all these companies that are building solutions and uh, specifically for myself, I'm with ISVs. Uh, so these are companies that are building solutions on uh, on our platforms, on our cloud. And AI is top of mind. And they're all, uh, they're looking at, you know, how can we take advantage of all these great new services and offerings that we've got? And, uh, and what does that look like? So we're doing a lot of talk on AI for sure. Yeah, not only is it uh, talk of mind among technical folks, but just even the popular press is uh, talking, is kind of uh, singing the praises of what AI can do. And I think what, one of the things that's driving that is a company called OpenAI that Microsoft recently partnered with. Can you talk a little mm -hmm. bit about that? Yeah. So uh, in uh, in January of this year, that was when the the big announcements came out from Microsoft around uh, the partnership. Well, it, so it's interesting. I think. The announcements came out in January about how we were really integrating uh, the open AI technologies and, you know, chat GPT was, you know, was already out uh, through open AI. And so people might have been familiar with, you know, how they could use this AI technology and ask questions, get all these answers. Uh, the real announcement in January was that Microsoft was going to be implementing uh, those technologies into some of our products and services like Bing. Um, and then with the vision looking ahead to uh, office and uh, and windows and, and other things and that really kind of opened the floodgates then where people realized oh this is going to be uh you know this is going to be something now where we can really take advantage in a very uh commercialized way uh of of ai um and so uh what's interesting about that though is i think if if that's all people knew or heard they would think that this is a very recent thing they would think that oh microsoft and open ai must have had some sort of agreement and uh, and made this happen but the relationships actually stretches back quite a number of years and so OpenAI as a company uh, was founded in 2015 and so they were doing their own thing in 2015 they started the company started working on on uh, on their technologies in the meantime at Microsoft we've had AI services all the way back then as well um, mm -hmm. we call them our cognitive services and uh, it, it's a full suite which goes all the way down from um, you know pure machine learning uh, up to uh, managed services that you can just tie into like you know our, our vision API and, and that type of thing and and so we're we're not uh, we're not new to the AI space I think in general, what's happened now is we've we've added to our offerings through OpenAI, and now we have another great avenue to uh, to provide services to customers. Uh, interesting. So I, I've actually worked with cognitive services a lot, and I'm a big fan because of the power and the simplicity of it, that you don't have to be a machine learning expert in order to take advantage of models that are already built for you. And I've, I've, I think that's that was really the big selling point for cognitive services. Um, is that something that evolved into what we're doing now, or is that something that was sort of parallel to it? It's very parallel. So um, so if we think about like, so 2016 was one of the key milestones on the cognitive services timeline where it used to be called Project Oxford, and then it was yeah. finally rebranded into cognitive services. And that's where we really started to see uh, that branding and acceleration move forward. Yeah. So if you think about it, you know, 2016 to now, you know, it's seven years where cognitive services has been in play. Um, at the same time, there was a couple of interesting uh, key data points that happened uh, or on timeline points. One of them is that in 2016, uh, Microsoft actually hired uh, Kevin Scott to be their CTO, which 
So this sounds bad, but um, I didn't even know Kevin Scott was our CTO until, <laughs> until the announcements came out. Um, but but I think that's actually one of the cool things about Kevin is that he was very much behind the scenes. So, I mean, I think if you talk to a lot of developers and you say, like, when you think of Microsoft, who do you think of? And they're going to say Scott Hanselman. They're going to say Scott Guthrie. Uh, people that were, you know, we regularly maybe, see, maybe Satya. Right? <laughs> oh, Satya, of, of course. Yeah, Satya as well. Um, but And, but uh, and Darcy. From, and, and not, I'm definitely not in that group. <laughs> I appreciate that though. Um, but with with Kevin, uh, and he's got an interesting lineage. He actually came um, from LinkedIn through the acquisition that we had. And then he was, he was uh, hired into Microsoft to be the chief technology officer. And what he saw early on was, um, was this opportunity around AI, and especially through his connections in the Bay Area, what OpenAI was doing. And so he was the one that really, made the introduction, the connection between Satya and um, uh, OpenAI CEO and and started having those discussions to see how can we have this partnership. And so it was in 2019 when Microsoft actually did the first big investment into OpenAI and also entered in, and this is important, the exclusivity agreement. So as part of that, um, Microsoft would basically get access to leveraging OpenAI technologies, but um, OpenAI, OpenAI would also exclusively be on Azure, but Microsoft would also heavily invest in um, in a lot of different ways beyond just just the money piece of it into OpenAI to the point where in 2020 we actually built uh, a supercomputer internally that uh, was specifically designed for AI and that OpenAI uh, engineering could use to further develop their large language models. Um, and we would work. We would work in in concert with them. Uh, fun fact is that there's actually a website. Uh, I don't have it handy, but there's a website that actually lists the top ten supercomputers that exist at any given time. And so when we did our supercomputer, we were in the top five um, in the world at that point. And uh, we had 285,000 CPUs and 10,000 GPUs. Now that was in 2020. And so fast forward to three years to today, we are not in. In the top five and if you look at that list i think the last time i saw it was a few months ago and there was uh it's like three million cpus or something it's it's insane um so so there was a, a whole partnership and relationship with open ai that was being built at the same time our cognitive services were also being developed and continued being developed and then um what also happened in during that 2020 period um was that we created a new division within microsoft called ai at scale and this group was dedicated to start looking at expanding the boundaries of you know how large language models could impact our products like office 365 and windows because while OpenAI was working on their large language models we were also doing work with large language models and not only internally but partnering with uh, with other companies like nvidia um so there's there's a lot of different ai parallels that are happening all at the same time um throughout the last eight to 10 years. Parallel uh, processing. Have, yeah, exactly, right? Yeah. And, and so now we're here today and uh, yes, OpenAI uh, and Azure OpenAI services are really top of mind for everybody. But I, what I'm hopeful for this is that this is gonna enable us to really open up those conversations about what Microsoft's full array of AI offerings are, uh, which includes cognitive services, um, you know, our machine learning uh, platform, and then also with OpenAI services. Yeah. Uh, I, by the way, I think I found it. It's top500.org. Oh, like maybe it is. The site you're talking about yeah. here. And, uh, and I, I, you also touched on something that uh, is, is interesting, that Microsoft doesn't often do this. This is, wasn't an acquisition. This was a partnership. OpenAI yes. still exists as a company. Microsoft is investing in them, but neither company owns the other company. We're that's that's very true. This. Yeah, it's it's not like a, a GitHub situation where you know we acquired GitHub and and now they're part part of us. Um, OpenAI is its own company. Uh, we just happen to have this exclusivity agreement and this investment agreement, um, but but they're they are separate. Like you know when you when you go and do business specifically with OpenAI, you're doing business with OpenAI. Um, yeah, uh, talk a little bit how we're incorporating that into our products, the into the Microsoft products. I know we've got. You mentioned Bing. Uh, I don't think you've mentioned the co-pilots yet, but there's a there's a lot of things that we're taking the technology that OpenAI provides and 
actually building into products that folks were already using? Yeah. So if you think about, um, if you, if you look at the announcements that we've made recently around uh, Bing, around Windows, and then around Office, I think those are really great um, examples as well for people to see, oh, here's how we can leverage um, generative AI um, and chat GPT like functionality uh, within a line of business application, what that could look like and how that would work. Um, the co-pilots piece is, and and I, I do a presentation uh, based on kind of what we're talking about. And I've got this great slide where I'm like, before it was this, and I have a picture of Steve Ballmer, you know, doing developers, developers, developers. <laughs> and then I have another image and it's Kevin Scott who's on there. Who's like co-pilots, co-pilots, co-pilots. He didn't actually say that, but I mean, it, that's basically where we're at, where co-pilots is really at the forefront because that's, that is the, the, the Norman culture and, and avenue, I think that many organizations are going to look at to say, okay, we need to build a co-pilot now for our application or our ecosystem. And what does that look like? And, uh, it, and it's, it's really, uh, I think it's really going to be transformative in how, um, in how end users interact with systems, because in the same way, like right now we can use chat GPT to, you know, write me a song or, you know, give me information about, uh, it, typically whatever's out there on the internet, because a lot of these LLMs have been trained on publicly available data. When you take that power and now you laser focus it on business data, and you're now able to ask a system things like, show me the top customer accounts in the last quarter where X, 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 you know, whatever it is, um, and it's able to bring you back that information in a way where you're now conver you know, having that conversation with the, the system, that's going to be, uh, that's going to be extremely transformative. Um, and I'm already seeing that with some partners where they're really investing in building their own co-pilots and they're seeing what these use cases can look like. So for companies that are looking at how they can leverage, um, how they can leverage co-pilots with their their applications and, and what that looks like to build. Uh, what I'm seeing with a lot of the partners I'm I'm working with is it's, it's kind of twofold. One is there is a uh, an awareness to the different types of roles that you now need within your organization, and uh, you see things around like prompt engineer and um, other roles like that that are very generative AI specific. This all sounds really awesome, but there's some challenges to it, aren't there? Yeah, there are. And I, I think the the real top of mind thing is is understanding what needs to change organizationally uh, to implement this. So a lot of people, I, I think there's there's that sort of natural reaction. You you see a webinar, you read an article, and people get really excited. And then they say, how do we do this? What are we what are we going to be able to implement? Yeah, the CEO and reads the magazine exactly, on the airplane, right? And when he lands, he says, we got to do this, make this happen. <laughs> We got to do this, make it happen. It should, you know, how, how many weeks is this going to take? And, um, and the reality is, is that it like, like introducing any technology into your organization, you need to have change management plan. You need to have an awareness of what this means from, um, if we look at it just from the engineering point of view, uh, what are the roles that you're going to need? Uh, what are the skill sets that are required? How do you architecture these solutions? Because there are differences. And, and we have lots of documentation and uh, and resources available uh, that, that can steer people uh, down those paths and answer those questions. Um, but then there's also a, a key piece of it as well. And, and this is actually something that we talk about quite a bit at Microsoft with our partners and customers and even lead with this is around responsible AI. And um, acknowledging that, you know, as as great as this technology is and how amazing this technology is, there is a piece of it where we we need to do it in a responsible way. And this is also very top of mind, I think, with people, um, you know, whether it's in conversation, whether we're talking at the government levels and, and looking at potential legislation that's going through. Uh, a lot of news stories out there where you've got CEOs from even some of these uh, AI companies who are saying we definitely need to put some sort of checks and balances in. Um, and so what we've done at Microsoft is we actually have a whole framework uh, around responsible AI, which addresses things like fairness, reliability and safety, uh, privacy and security, inclusiveness, transparency and accountability. And um, what that means, not just from how you build a solution with AI, but organizationally, how does it transform that? What are things that that you need to be aware of across all your different departments? Because in the same way that any sort of major technical shift will impact an entire business in how you how you do business, AI is going to have that same trickle down effect. So 
uh, it's great that your developers understand about AI. Does your does your legal team understand? Hey, what are the new ways that we need to write up? Um, you know, terms and conditions or agreements or anything like that. Now that we're factoring in AI, what are the implications of that? If we think about um, how we're thinking about diversity and inclusion in organizations, because we've all seen a lot of the uh, a lot of the early stories with some of the earlier AI services around inclusiveness, where um, there are certain biases that are built into the AIs. Um, it, in in as I think the one that always sticks out to me is the one where there was a, a just a hand dryer in a washroom, and depending on the pigment of your skin, it may or may not actually trigger the the the, the dryer. Yeah, sure. Yeah, if, if and, it was trained only on pale skin, then yeah. if a dark skinned person puts their hands under it, it wouldn't recognize that as a hand. Exactly. And so with AI, we want to make sure that those biases are being accounted for. Um, the example I give when I give this talk is. Uh, I, I found an article recently about um, it was I asked AI to give me pictures of how Europeans think of Americans from every state. And so, of <laughs> course, you had all these interesting pictures that that came out um, and and a lot of stereotypes. The, the guy from Georgia, you know, was in a it was in a peach orchard. Uh, the person from Louisiana was uh, was eating crawfish, you know, at a table. Um, but what was interesting about it all was that every single picture that was generated, all of the people depicted were Caucasian. And so, so again, it talks about inclusiveness and bias there where it's, well, does that mean then that Europeans don't recognize that in America, it's a very multicultural uh, population and there's lots of different people from everywhere in the world that's represented? Why would you, you know, I, I don't think Europeans would think that way. So why is the AI thinking that way? So it, it goes into all of those things, right? That that we need to um, that we need to address. Um, so it's any organization that's looking to adopt this really needs to recognize that it is. We talk about digital transformation. There's really more of like an AI transformation that needs to happen within organizations if you're going to be adopting adopting AI, regardless of whether it's open AI or other things. Um, yeah, lots of there's technical issues, there's ethical issues. There's a lot to think oh, about in this. Yeah, absolutely. I think we're at a watershed period right now because there is such an explosion in interest and in technology along AI. What what's your prediction of what's going to happen in the future? So I think um, I think like any new technology that comes out, uh, there's there's going to be uh, there's going to be this this kind of rush where everyone's going to be you know testing it out. They want to see. How far we can take it? You know, what can we do? Um, we're going to see this this sort of boom of, uh, and and I think we're we're kind of it's funny. Uh, all of a sudden, overnight, it seemed we uh, on social media we no longer saw people who were talking about cryptocurrency. Instead, that we had a whole <laughs> bunch of new AI experts that were out there. Um, but I think what we're what we're going to see is um, is is people doing a lot of experimentation. Trying to figure out, because here's the other thing too, is that as much as we're getting excited about the technology from those that build the software, you have a whole bunch of end users out there that ultimately are the ones that are going to define what's useful and not useful from AI from their perspectives in, okay. in whatever scenarios that they have. And so I think that we're going to be presenting a lot and saying, look what you can do with AI. And then we're also going to see a reaction to say, this is really awesome. Let's do more of this, or that's interesting, but I wish it could do this. And so, um, what what I think is great though is we're at a point in time now where we are really making it accessible, and um, and so the with with the open AI services, um, what I'm hoping for is that not only are people going to get excited about that, but now we can also talk to them about hey, here's from a Microsoft point of view, here's all the other cognitive services that we have. Here's all the other machine learning tools that we have. So yes, get excited about this, but recognize that you can do a lot of really interesting solutions with our full suite of AI services that we have. So an example I'll give you is, um, so uh, there's a company in uh, in Canada called Media Valet. Media Valet does a, um, uh, it's called a, a DAM, a digital asset management platform. So Damn. think about, Damn, I know, right? We yeah, we had a lot of fun with with uh, with with coming up with fun ways to to say that when we were working with them. It's a PG thirteen uh, show. <laughs> <laughs> so think about uh, any any agency that has um you know like a marketing or sales department that has a large number of uh, digital assets, images, videos, whatever it is, and they 
within the, those departments, they have their own workflows where an image will need to be approved or, you know, artwork needs to be approved, all that sort of thing, right? Their, their solution manages that. It itemizes it, it makes it searchable, um, and, uh, and, and it's, uh, it's, it's a great platform. One area, though, that they they found interesting success that wasn't in their typical um, uh, target user base was in uh, science and research. So they partnered with the Jane Goodall Foundation, and Jane Goodall was the uh, the famous uh, chimpanzee oh, gorillas researcher. in the mist. Absolutely right. So there are decades of uh, of assets that they've collected: images, videos, notes. And so what they did was they partnered with Media Valet and Media Valet leveraged our facial recognition uh, AI and was able to identify each chimpanzee when the images and the video so that now if they ever want to say, hey, bring me up all of the research that we have on this specific chimpanzee, they can now get it. And so this is opening up a whole new realm where in the field of, of research, scientific research, um, or any sort of organization that has a large library of digital assets that they want to be able to make easier to search and maybe they're looking for certain aspects of things where facial recognition could come into play this is a really interesting use of ai um mm -hmm. so so if you think about our cognitive services and you know how we we have so many different uh different offerings hopefully this open ai um interest is going to spur even more ideation around those things um, language is another one so in canada uh, a couple of years ago we actually um, we were really thrilled to announce that we added an indigenous language in uh, to our translation services and we worked yeah. with the government of uh, nunavut to to make that happen and so there's a there's a movement right now um, in uh, in the indigenous landscape to uh, and actually no not just in the indigenous landscape but I, I think if you look worldwide recognizing how many languages that we're losing uh, in a very fast um, uh, fast pace we want to we want to save those we want to we want to collect those we want to make sure that for future generations that we we have uh, access to those technology is a great way to be able to do that and mm. uh, and one way that we're able to um, to weave that into our products and services so that those who are more comfortable speaking their native languages actually have the ability to. So now, if somebody, for instance, is you know, on a presentation and it's being delivered in English, they're able to use our translation services and see it in Inuktitut in and be able to read it or hear it in, in their native tongue. So, uh, so there's lots of amazing opportunities for AI beyond, um, beyond kind of, you know, the, the, the typical, um, uh, we see a lot of demos that are really cool, you know, and you kind of see, you know, hey, we're going to, uh, I, I don't know about you, but, but me and some friends were, uh, we're seeing, hey, you know, chat GPT, write me, uh, write me a, a love song about a pop star and a Kansas City Chiefs player. I, I'm, I feel like other people maybe are doing <laughs> that right now, too. Uh, and that's cool. But there's really awesome, meaningful applications to AI as well that we can be doing. Um, if I am a software developer, this wh where do I get started? This is such a broad area. What's what's a good starting point if I wanted to build AI solutions? Yeah, so uh, so one of the the best ways uh, to start off with is if you go to our Microsoft Learn portal, um, we have a whole track around uh, developing with AI, not just with Open AI, but also our cognitive services. Um, and we also have uh, we we also have learning paths that talk about responsible AI and and, and how you come about that. Um, that is probably our, our, our best starting point. I think um, when it comes to the open AI piece, uh, there are pathways to be able to enable uh, open AI within your Azure subscriptions. And uh, we've got some really cool projects that are out there. I noticed that one of the teams just released the Azure chat GPT on GitHub. Uh, so that's actually so and that's actually a good a good clarification for those listening. You know, you hear Chat GPT, and it gets used a lot as you know. Oh, let's add Chat GPT. Like Chat GPT is an application that's leveraging the underlying GPT models. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so what we've done is we've created an Azure Chat GPT, which is an application you can deploy to your to your Azure um, tenant, and it's basically Chat GPT, but specifically written to to run in in Azure. Um, I do know that uh, we have a lot of demand right now for OpenAI, and I think that uh, we're we're going to see more of these staged rollouts of access. 
Um, but uh, even with the open AI, even though if that takes a little bit longer where to where we can, you know, really open the floodgates to allow, you know, anyone at any time to get access to it, the cognitive uh, services are available uh, now. And those are things that people can take advantage of without any fear of, you know, being on a, a wait list or anything like that. Awesome. We're just about at time, but before you go, can you tell us a little bit about the conference that you run? Oh, I would love to. Yeah, thank you for asking about that. So I run a, a conference up here in Canada called Prairie DevCon. Uh, you can go to prairiedevcon.com. Uh, we, uh, we run it in three cities, uh, Winnipeg, Regina, and Calgary. So it's a Canadian-based conference. So for those of you that are in Canada, know that there is, uh, there is a Canadian conference on the prairies uh, that you can head to. And uh, for those of you in the U.S., um, you know, we, uh, we're definitely accessible by flights to, to those cities. So uh, we'd love to have you up. And uh, yeah, we, uh, we run it every year um, in, uh, in each city. I've got uh, Regina coming up in a few weeks, and then we've got Calgary at the end of November. Uh, it's always a good time, and we, uh, we get a lot of really great speakers from across North America that come up. So uh, yeah, I appreciate you asking about that, and uh, we'd definitely love to have any listeners uh, come out. I hope I can make it up there. Absolutely. We definitely have to get you up there for sure. Awesome. Darcy, thank you so much for your time. This has been really educational. Hey, thank you so much, David. Appreciate it. Technology is always better with friends.